incumbent upon us to strive for a deep and nuanced understanding of the world around us, especially when the stakes are high. We turn to experts, and it's really our privilege today to have Dr. Jennifer Dickinson, a true expert on Ukraine. She's an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at UVM, where she's also the provost for academic affairs. Her research into Ukraine is deep. Please join me and the rest of the Champlain community in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Dickinson. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. I, I think um, from our side, people who have experience in Ukraine and have studied it for many years have an obligation to bring that knowledge forward and to answer questions that people might have about the situation as well as the country itself. So today, what I'm going to try and do is put Ukraine in context a little bit. I was asked to focus more on Ukraine and maybe some of the background to the current conflict. You know, this has been such a moment by moment evolution of what's going on there. I could spend hours trying to keep you up to the minute about everything that's happening. So we're going to focus on the context. And then during Q&A, uh, perhaps we can answer either general or more specific questions, and I'll try my best to answer those. Okay, so I'm going to start off really quickly with who I am a little bit about my background and my work. I'm a linguistic and economic anthropologist. I look at economic change over time in Ukraine, and I focus on the intersection between language and culture. I have been working in Ukraine since 1992, so the, for the mathematically inclined, that's already 30 years now. I do research in both rural and urban areas, and mostly in Western and Central Ukraine. Um, I've also done research in Russia and the Baltic states in the past. I'm fluent in Ukrainian, Russian, and the dialects of the region of Ukraine where I work, and I'll show you that on a map in a minute. And I also have some knowledge of Ukrainian sign language. The photograph here is from my most recent research project where I'm working with um, experts in higher education for deaf and hard of hearing Ukrainians. And this is a group of deaf Ukrainian students in the Western Ukrainian city of Lviv who are learning to be dental technicians. I was a Fulbright scholar in Ukraine in the spring of 2017 and 2018. And that's uh, what this research project was mainly focused on. I've also been an international election observer for Ukrainian presidential elections in both 2014 and 2019. So, and this is my happy place. This is a view of the village that I have been working in in um, southwestern, southwestern Ukraine since um, 1995. So it's been a long journey. So to get started, uh, when I posted the poster for this event on Facebook and I invited uh, friends to come, one of my Ukrainian friends posted this response. Jennifer, tell everyone about us, about Ukraine. The world should know about such a wonderful country. And this is someone who has uh, fled the city of Kiev and is living in another location that is further from the, uh, the bombing that's going on currently in Kiev. So that's how much she cared about me coming here and talking to you about this. So here, Ukraine, such a wonderful country. So this map shows Ukraine in context. And I think we can learn actually a lot from looking at this map because um, you can see it, first of all, in the context of Europe, where it's located. And to some degree, you can see it in the context of Russia, which is that larger country that's off there to the right side of the map. You can also, if you look in the corner, see Ukraine in the context of the larger European, North African, and Central Asian context. So I'm going to give you a few fun facts. Fun fact number one, as you may have been able to tell from that map, Ukraine is the largest country located fully in Europe. And in fact, there's a marker in Ukraine of the geographical center of Europe. And there is a picture of a much younger me standing in front of the geographical center of Europe. So I actually, um, I'll point out where I work. Thank you. 
And where's the, is that this? Right here. Okay. So my research area is right here. And I just want to point out around here is where the border between Europe and Asia begins at the Ural Mountains in Russia. So I think from this, you can begin to understand how it's possible that the cent geographic center of Europe is actually located in Ukraine. So I, I ask us all to reorient our mentality about East and West with respect to talk about Ukraine. And also to realize that Ukraine is uh, quite a bit larger than many of the countries of Europe. And I think it's, it's um, slightly larger than France. So you can get a, a sense of that as well. Second Ukraine fun fact, Ukraine has borders with seven countries. Four of those countries are in the EU. I feel like I'm doing, I'm doing a Jeopardy question for y'all here. And the same four are in NATO. So does anyone want to throw out a couple of countries that might be those four countries? Yes, Poland's one. There's three others. Yes, right here. Romania is another. I'm just gonna, you can keep going. I'm yep. just going to switch some stuff up. On okay. Uh, yes. No, no, almost, but not quite. Yes. Latvia. Nope, Latvia almost also as well. It's it's just pushed out by Belarus. Anybody else? Slovakia, great. And there's one more, our favorite. Moldova is one of the border countries, but it is not in the EU or in NATO. So Hungary, our friend Hungary and Orban, is, <laughs> is in um, NATO and the EU, but is, um, there you go, also a border country. So if you can get to the next slide. Yeah, if you want to show my presentation. If we go to the next slide, you can actually see how this plays out. So Lithuania is up here, Latvia is, is up here above Belarus. Belarus um, is here and you can see uh, where the troops came in uh, from Belarus. Um, so here we have Poland, we have Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. <laughs> And then finally, uh, Moldova, Belarus, and Russia are the remaining countries. Okay. So who lives in Ukraine? There are about 44 million people living in Ukraine. Um, compare that to about 150 million living in Russia. Um, about 78% are Ukrainian. I think that um, that percentage may have shifted, uh, but there, I don't know when the last census data came out, um, but the last I have is 78% Ukrainian. 17% Russian, and this is what is sometimes called passport identity. This is your formal ethnic or national identity that's registered. And then 5% is other. So actually there's a significant percentage of the population that is neither Russian nor Ukrainian. And about 70% of the population lives in urban areas. Again, this is a kind of a mushy number in part because of the very high rate of migrant labor out of Ukraine and into other countries, mostly countries in Central and Western Europe. Okay, um, a little bit about religion in the country. Um, the most common religious affiliation in terms of large um, religious groups is Christian. And then uh, the remainder uh, belong in um, other, other groups. Um, and the, the, actually the, all that white space there, I believe are people who do not identify as having a religious affiliation. So you can see that there are several Orthodox churches present in Ukraine, and I won't go into that whole debate, but there is certainly um, <laughs> some discussion to be had regarding the difference between the Kiev Patriarchate and the Moscow Patriarchate and the, um, the Ossephalus Ukrainian Church, which has merged with the Kiev Patriarchate. There are also Greek Catholic and Roman Catholic uh, believers in Ukraine. Many of them live in the area of the country where I work, particularly Roman Catholics. There's a lot of Hungarians um, that are, are uh, Roman Catholic. Um, on the, this is something that is actually gonna be quite interesting because there's some new data about this. 
So as I said, I, uh, I work on language and always a big discussion in Ukraine is about language and identity. On the 2001 national census, 67% of people cited Ukrainian as their mother tongue. So um, at that time, that generally meant, well, if, I, if it says Ukrainian and I'm on my passport, Ukrainian must be my mother tongue. And since then, people have done a lot of research to, to find out a little bit more subtlety with respect to actual language spoken. 24% cited Russian as their mother tongue. Um, and I do want to say that this is actually changing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I also want to note that Ukrainian Russian bilingualism rates are between 85 and 97 percent, and it actually that has remained true. So although um, more people are speaking Ukrainian and are identifying as primary Ukrainian speakers, in fact, there is still a very high rate of bilingualism. The rate of passive bilingualism where you can understand the other language is extremely high. And then the rate of people who are able to switch languages and speak in both languages is also quite high. Um, this is, uh, uh, th these are some data from that are based on that older census, but you can sort of see, um, this is where people start to get the idea that maybe there's a split, like one, one half of the country <laughs> speaks Ukrainian and the other half of the country speaks Russian. But in fact, that you can see even in the highly Russian dominated areas, there are th about 25 to 30% of people identify as being uh, native Ukrainian speakers. Whereas if you look in the Western part of the country, that gets much higher, it gets up into the 90s. And in uh, Crimea, uh, this was before Crimea was annexed, you can see that only 10% of speakers identified as being Ukrainian speakers. Now this map puts things in a slightly different light though. When you look at it at the, the regional level for the administrative regions, it seems very cut and dry. But when you look at it in this way, which is by um, city, town, and village council, so in other words, kind of independent polities within Ukraine, you can see that the picture is a little bit different. And I also want to point out that this is the area of Ukraine where I work, and there is a great deal of linguistic diversity here, a lot of Hungarian and Romanian speakers in that area. And you can also see that how that actually plays out in terms of Crimea. Uh, most of these dots are uh, crime, native Crimean Tatar speakers, and the remainder identify as primary Russian speakers. So um, I, I think it's worth asking the question, does language equal identity in Ukraine? This was uh, something I got a lot more questions about in 2014, uh, when there was uh, a, another uh, revolution in Ukraine. Um, and uh, there was a lot of focus at that time on a supposed division between Ukrainian and Russian speakers and Ukrainian and Russian identified people. But in fact, when we look at how people use language, region and whether you're in an urban area, which tends the urban areas tend to be uh, more Russian language dominated in the center and the east and the south of the country, those are better indicators than ethnicity of your language choice. However, when I said things are changing, they are changing and they're changing from generation to generation. Younger people are more likely to identify Ukrainian as their mother tongue. So according to uh, 2021 um, poll data, uh, people under 30, 83.3% of them identified Ukrainian as their mother tongue. Whereas for people over 60, only 70, 3.6% identified Ukrainian as their mother tongue. So you can see there's been an, almost a 10% change across time in how many people identify with Ukrainian regardless of their nationality. Norms surrounding language use are also changing and this is very interesting to look at. When I first began doing research in Ukraine, the standard norm was people would speak the language that they felt most comfortable in. So people tended not to change languages to accommodate to the other person, unless it was clear that they really didn't understand. So if I started speaking Russian, someone else would speak Ukrainian and they would just expect that I would understand their Ukrainian, I would continue to speak Russian and they would continue to speak Ukrainian. However, there's some evidence from looking at these poll data that people are beginning to change their practices. 
and to accommodate more to the language that the other person is speaking. Uh, this is a really interesting social change, and it has to do with ideas and expectations around what it means to speak a language and how flexible you're expected to be in communicating with other people. Here's fun fact number three, as many of you may know. Um, the current president of Ukraine became famous as a comedian. His biz, biz, biggest success was as playing the president of Ukraine, Ukraine in the popular show, Servant of the People, and there's a poster for it, Sluha Narodu in Ukrainian. Um, what I, I like about this is that um, in the show, he's a, he's a school teacher and his you know, students kind of play a prank on him and they sign him up for the presidential elections and he is elected. And then he becomes the president. And he's kind of this average guy who ends up in charge of the country. But in the, the whole point of the show is that in the end, he is the president that Ukraine needs at that time. And I think in that sense, Zelensky is the president that Ukraine needed at this time. I don't think anyone <laughs> expected him to do as good as he has. Um, you know, uh, but he, he has, um, he was a skit comedian. Uh, he came up through traditions of improvisational comedy. He can think on his feet. He's very smart and he's really good in front of a camera. So his work recently has been in creating short inspirational videos that provide information, but also um, kind of draw the line around what the Ukrainian spot response will be on a day-to-day -day basis to events and the current battle status within the country. So in some ways, a comedian has ended up being really the best, um, the best president that Ukraine could have elected in 2019. Um, and I did think it was, it was sort of like, it was very meta, you know, <laughs> he, his show is called Servant of the People, and then he named his political party Servant of the People, and then he got elected. So, um, uh, and by a very large margin, I'll say as well. Now, this brings me to one of the points I want to make about Ukraine. A couple of people have asked me, well, why did you, I started my doing my research work in Russia, and then I switched over to Ukraine. And people have asked me, well, why did you do that? Why was that? What was it about Ukraine that was interesting to you? And I said, one of the things that's interesting to me about Ukraine is the cleverness and the, the ability of Ukrainian people to kind of find the humor in almost any situation. So even now in the worst possible time, people are circulating daily, all kinds of new cartoons, plays on words, jokes that are designed to help people see the everyday humor in their situation and to keep going. And I think that's a really good way of summarizing the will of the Ukrainian people. So this is a joke that's actually from 2014. And it, it kind of is pushing it back on this narrative that Ukraine is Russia. So it claims for Ukrainians the ancient history of Kievan Rus as being the foundation of not Russian history, but the foundation of Ukrainian history. So it's saying you can't claim us for yourselves. This is our history and it belongs to this country. So I am gonna give kind of a, a race through history from 1991 to the present, just to give a little bit of background on events that kind of set the stage for where we are right now. Um, I, I want to start though with in a 2017 poll, we learned that residents of Ukraine like borscht and they like dumplings as opposed to other foods, and that they prefer meat dishes to potato dishes. So there's a little bit of extra color and history for you. And here's a not so fun fact. So in 30 years of independence, Ukraine has had two revolutions, but it's also had six presidents. So they've had peaceful, in general, peaceful change of power across a number of different leaders. And if we look at other countries in the region like Russia and Belarus, we do not see that kind of change in leadership over time. Ukraine, while it's a young democracy, is, is very invested in its democracy. There's a public sphere, there's open debate and discussion. Since 2004, um, when they had their first revolution, the so-called Orange Revolution, 
presidential elections in Ukraine have generally been judged to be free and fair elections. These are some pictures from the Orange Revolution in 2004. So just to, to take us back to what led up to that. In August of 1991, Ukraine declared independence from the Soviet Union. So this was sort of at the time that, um, that the, the uh, coup happened in Moscow. And it was clear that the, the Soviet Union was going to come apart at the seams. In December of that year, there was a referendum vote on leaving the, the USSR. And every area of Ukraine, including Crimea, voted overwhelmingly to leave the USSR and establish an independent Ukraine. So then it took a few years, it took about four and a half years before Ukraine got a new constitution. So the, the Ukrainian constitution dates from 1996. There was a president who served two terms. And then there were the first kind of the first change of power. So a big moment for young democracy happened. And there were a lot of accusations that the election was stolen. So you had two candidates and the accusation was the, the one of the candidates had you know, been guilty of things like ballot uh, box stuffing and so forth. And um, in support of the candidate that had been named the loser, um, Viktor Yushchenko, there was a mass sort of coming out into the streets and demanding that there, justice and demanding free and fair elections. So the Supreme Court ruled that new election, a new runoff election had to be held. And in December of 2004, the Yushchenko was elected in a fresh runoff elections. So the Orange Revolution ends peaceably and you have new elections and a new president is elected. He's not a particular, even after that grand entrance, he's not a particularly successful president. And somewhat to um, the West surprise, in January of 2010, his original rival, Viktor Yanukovych, was elected, re-elected in what actually was considered to be a fairly free and fair election. However, um, Yanukovych uh, was not a particularly successful president, even in his second chance. And um, the, the, the kind of the tipping point was when he was on the brink of signing a trade deal with the European Union and at the last minute backed out and turned towards an alternative trade deal that he wanted to sign with Russia. So there were mass student led protests in November of 2013 and this they all began to gather in an area of Kiev that's called the Maidan so it's referring to the to independent square and then a nearby square called European Square. So in uh, November, that, that gathering uh, began and it became bigger and bigger until there were thousands of people camping out and protesting in this area. However, over the next few months, the situation deteriorated. There was state-sponsored violence and um, uh, the, uh, the Maidan protests ended with um, snipers shooting some of the fighters on the Maidan, Yanukovych may or may not have abdicated and he fled Ukraine for Russia. During this period and immediately after that, Russia invaded and annexed the um, area of Ukraine known as Crimea, so that um, peninsula at the bottom of Ukraine. So, and here is a, an example that you can just see the sheer masses of people. And there were um, barricades of burning tires that were used to maintain control over this area by the protesters. Starting from that moment of that second revolution, there, um, President Yanukovych fled Ukraine, Russia annexed Crimea. Immediately after that, two republics in the far east of Ukraine, um, uh, declared independence and um, uh, Russian backed separatists, you know, began to um, engage with the with Ukrainian troops um, in an armed conflict over control of those areas. At this time, Poroshenko, a new president was elected and he's a candy magnet. I had one old lady tell me that she was voting for him so she could get a bag of sugar. So she felt like he was going to give her he was going to bring a nice big bag of sugar to her house and drop it off. Um, 
And so escalating sanctions against Russia, primarily for the annexation of Crimea, began to be imposed in 2014. There was a ceasefire that was negotiated in Minsk, and then a, the, when that ceasefire broke, a second ceasefire was negotiated in 2015. Um, in 2016, a, a UN report asserted that Russia was involved in the conflict in Ukraine, which had not necessarily been made clear. Russia had denied it. Um, however, there were some evidence uh, regarding the, the weapons and so forth that were being used, the uniforms of the people in the area and so forth. Um, the, uh, at the same time that uh, EU began to impose increased and renewed sanctions on Russia, they also began to open up opportunities for Ukrainians to have more interaction with the EU. So they approved visa-free travel for Ukrainians, and I can tell you this was an enormous change. So now Ukrainians could travel freely to the EU and stay for, I believe, 60 days without a visa. And um, that had not been possible before. It greatly increased travel and communication. So there was, um, there was some back and forth. There's always been constant fighting in that area since 2014. But in 2017, the ceasefire failed again. Fighting broke out in earnest in Donbass. And there were you know, sort of repeated attempts to, to discuss and to negotiate a new peace. In 2019 and early 2020, there have been a series of new negotiations and, and ceasefires established and then broken. However, over the past two years, there have been escalating tensions and increased fighting. Then uh, 15 days ago, Russian forces invaded Ukraine from the north through Belarus. And I will say that for many experts, this was very surprising. The expectation, honestly, was that Russia would invade, would take Donbass completely, would occupy it, and that part, just like Crimea, would simply be cut off and added to Russia, leaving the remainder of Ukraine as a buffer against the EU. That's not what happened. So to conclude this little piece of history, I'm just including an example um, from the 2014 elections. These are people engaged in uh, a carefully defined process for um, reviewing ballots and uh, electing the next president of Ukraine in May of 2014. So I'm, I chose to use this graphic. I think it's a similar one that may, many of you may have seen. It just shows the relative territorial size of Russia versus Ukraine. And as I mentioned before, Russia also has about three times the population of Ukraine. And this, of course, is not to mention the fact that Russia is a major nuclear power they have enormous military capabilities and including a large air force. So what was expected to happen was that Russia would sweep in, would crush Ukrainian uh, resistance and would take control of the country. But here we are, it's 15 days later and Ukraine has still not capitulated and uh, Russia has not be able, been able to gain control of any major cities, let alone the entire country. So a little bit by the numbers, and I will say that it's incredibly difficult to get good numbers regarding what is going on in the Ukraine war right now. We do know that 516 uh, civilians have been confirmed killed as of Tuesday. Um, uh, some quote much higher numbers, some quote lower numbers, but there's confirmation by independent sources of 516 civilians. Um, Estimates also very widely on Ukrainian soldiers killed. The Ukrainian government does not release those numbers, but several thousand Ukrainian soldiers have been killed, um, including both uh, soldiers in the army and volunteers. And um, there are somewhat, I think numbers agree that somewhat more uh, Russian soldiers than Ukrainian soldiers have been killed. Uh, the Ukrainian government claims 12,000. The US government claims something closer to 4,000 to 6,000. As of today, as of this day, 2.3 million refugees have left Ukraine through border crossings into all of those EU countries that we talked about earlier, through the border crossing in Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, and um, mostly into Poland. I wanted to include this photograph. It's one that um, that I had posted a few days ago. 
It shows uh, civilians being helped out of the suburban city of Irpin. It's about 20 miles away from Kiev, and it's a place that people, you know, they, it's like a bedroom community. They live in Irpin and they often commute to Kiev for their work. The bridge connecting Irpin um, was destroyed in a bomb attack, rendering it impossible for civilians to leave safely. So you can see this is an operation to help people leave. A good friend of mine lives in Irpin, and I've been uh, messaging with her trying to find out whether she wanted to stay. That was before the bombing. Then after the bombing, I didn't hear from her for a while, and she was able to tell me that she was able to get out. Uh, they found a window. They were able to get out. They had to walk from there to the train station in Kiev, where they were able to get on a train. They went to the border in Poland, and from Bo Poland, they were able to um, head to Italy. Uh, and where they are now with refugee status. So I hear a lot from people, what can I do? I see these, this horrible news, I read about it or I hear about it. I would like to be able to do something to help. One thing you're doing, you came here today, you learned a little bit more about Ukraine, I hope. But here's some other things that I would like you to consider doing. They fit with, um, with things that you are, are willing to give a try to. The first is to name the war and to name the aggressor. You can call it the Russian-Ukrainian war, the war in Ukraine, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. You can refer to civilian casualties of Russian bombings. But at this point, to talk about things like conflict in Ukraine, greatly underwhelm and do not convey what's going on here. This is a full-scale war, and it is involved, involves armed combat on both sides. You can honor the country and the capital. So say Ukraine and not the Ukraine. There's a long history as to why people prefer Ukraine and not the Ukraine. But suffice it to say that that is the way the country itself prefers to be referred to, and that's the instruction that it gives to foreign journalists, for example, when they write about Ukraine. Um, use Kiev and not Kiev. I know this is hard for people to pronounce, and I was going to ask whether there are any native Ukrainian speakers here who would like to stand up and pronounce the name of the capital city, and if not, I'll take you through an Americanized, easier way to say it. Anybody? Do you want to stand up and say it? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the thing is that there's a sound in this name that, that we don't have in English, so we can only guesstimate and try and get it right. But one thing it is not is Kiev. That, that goes out the window, okay? So it is pronounced more like Kiev and not like Kiev, okay? So if you'd like to practice with me, does anyone want to try, try to say after me, Kiev? Kiev, okay? So you are much closer now than if you, try, you said either Kiev or Kiev. You can also refer to the, the president as Volodymyr Zelensky. I hear a lot of people say Vladimir, which is not correct, although he was born into a Russian-speaking family. His, the, his formal name that he presents as the Ukrainian pres, president is the Ukrainian version of that name, Volodymyr. And so I, I also hear people say Volodymyr, which makes him sound a little bit like Voldemort. So I would say, I would say uh, Volodymyr. So if you can put that accent on the D, then you'll be a little bit closer. Um, and it's not Zelensky, it's Zelensky, but that's okay. And the last thing I'll ask is that you strive for empathy and not just sympathy. So it's important to remember that all refugees deserve compassion. We've seen a lot of refugee crises over the last several years. Uh, um, we've seen Afghan refugees, Syrian refugees, refugees from Yemen. And we have to remember that all of them deserve our compassion, including refugees from Ukraine, some of whom do not necessarily fit our ideas of what Ukrainian refugees might look like. There are people of African origin. There are people 
uh, there are uh, Romani people. All of these are uh, fleeing Ukraine and they all are equally deserving of our compassion. I also wanna point that out that no matter how much we can imagine what the origins of this are or who we should assign final blame form, no matter how we look back on that, there's no way that anyone deserves what is happening right now in Ukraine. I also wanna point out that only women, children, and men with special exceptions can leave Ukraine right now, meaning a lot of families have split up. So you, you see mostly women with individual children or with children, maybe one of their own and a sibling um, crossing the border and they've left their, their husbands and, um, and other relatives behind. Finally, humanitarian quarters have been very difficult to negotiate and maintain. So this is one of the reasons that people are so um, concerned about the situation in Ukraine. It's been difficult to get food into cities because they can't open humanitarian corridors. Those convoys keep getting bombed. It's been difficult to get people out of the cities because the only corridors that Russia is willing to open lead into Belarus or lead into Russian territory. Whereas these people probably would like to head in the opposite direction from the people who are bombing them. Finally, I'm sure that you expected me to say, what can you do? You can give to organizations. I wanted to give you a couple that I think are really deserving. So if you're interested in uh, donating money, um, United Help Ukraine Crane and Razum for Ukraine are two Ukrainian organizations that work with partner organizations. So they collect funds and materials and they help to distribute them through their networks within Ukraine. Sunflower Peace is a US organization and it is focused on humanitarian aid. So if you're not interested in supplying any kind of military aid or military defense aid, um, Sunflower of Peace provides primarily medical aid, but other aid as well. Uh, as you may know, there's a huge crisis with animals, animals that have had to be left behind, um, issues with uh, shelters, animal shelters that are unable to move their animals um, out of Ukraine. If you would like to help them, um, EFA is supporting animals shelters in Ukraine. There are other international organizations that are also providing support specifically to refugees and coordinating relief efforts. And those are the big ones that you're familiar with. They're UNICEF, the UN Commission on um, uh, the, the Human, I'm sorry, <laughs> the UNHRC, uh, CR, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the, um, what that stands for. Um, and then the IRC, the um, International Rescue Commission as well. But I wanted to end with just a final thought. I was looking at some recent polling from Ukraine. Yes, even now they poll, so love the sociologists. Um, and they did a poll of Ukrainians on the 8th and 9th of this week, and they just released the results today. When Ukrainians in different parts of the country were polled earlier this week, 91% answered hope when asked, when you think about the situation in the country, which do you feel more, hope or hopelessness. So if 91% of Ukrainians who are living through the situation can say that they have hope, I think we all can too. Thank you. So I wanted to open it up to questions. I know that there are people on Zoom, so, um, did you want to switch back and forth or? Lyle, do you want to handle Zoom and I'll ferry back and forth the microphone. If people in here have questions, if you want to kind of line up on the stairwells, I'll bring the microphone to you. Um, is this on? Cool. Um, I suppose my question would be, how do you think this is going to end? Because I don't see any way that Putin wins this, if I'm perfectly honest, because even if he does install a puppet government in Ukraine, they're never going to accept it. And even then, there'd still be a rebellion across uh, all of Ukraine. Apparently, they're saying 
the Ukrainians are claiming it's something like 11,000, 12,000 killed, and that's almost more than, I think it is more than the amount of US service men who were killed in um, Iraq and Afghanistan over 10 years. So I just, do you, I mean, how do you think this is gonna end? Um, I think there are a couple of ways that it, it, that it could end. Um, on, the, on the kind of the, the bad scenario side, um, as you may have heard, the, they're hitting hard on particular towns. One of them is the town of Mariupol, which is uh, one of the, you know, one of those port cities that they'd love to get access to so that they can begin bringing in troops from the ocean or from the sea. Um, so if Mariupol were to fall or one of the other uh, Black Sea cities giving them a clear way to bring in troops um, directly uh, from the sea, that would allow a huge influx into the country and um, that might overwhelm Ukrainian forces. I agree with you though, I still don't see it, see it ending well. Um, it is very clear that, uh, you know, I think I saw something recently that said 80% of Ukrainian adults, and that wasn't just a cr Ukrainian males, but 80% of Ukrainian adults said that they were ready to take up arms in defense of Ukrainian sovereignty. So you're fighting a really uphill battle there when you have 20 million adults and 80% of them are willing to fight for Ukrainian sovereignty. Um, I, I hate to speculate on the other end of how this could end well, because I also really am struggling to see that. I, you know, I'm trying to take it one day at a time, but, but I'm not, you are not the only one who does not see a way for this to end that does not involve destabilizing, if not all of Eastern Europe, then, then all of Europe itself. Did you have a follow-up? That's just my opinion on the, I mean, did you hear that okay? I, um, I the one thing I wanna say, one of the reasons why I gave you that 30 years of history, I think you are correct that where Ukrainians were in 1991 or in 2000 is not where they are now. Yeah. But that has not been the result of the events of the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. It has been a long trajectory um, and in particular has accelerated since 2014. So it became very clear that a majority of Ukrainians in 2014, I'm not saying 100%, but that a majority of Ukrainians were in favor of turning towards the West and developing a stronger relationship with the EU. For those who did not want to do that and wanted to turn towards the East and to closer ties with Russia, it, it kind of um, did set off a bit of a culture war as well as that conflict in Eastern Ukraine. But that process since tw in the last eight years has definitely created a different sense of civic Ukrainian identity that is not based on nationality mm -hmm. or on language for that matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's a no-fly zone and why is it important? So um, the no-fly zone, currently the, the vast majority of civilian ca casualties as well as um, property damage and what is preventing people from leaving the cities, uh, civilians from leaving cities and, and being able to get out uh, and either become an internally displaced person or an international refugee is the airstrikes that are coming. So I think the idea of a no-fly zone is to prevent Russian planes from being able to, to bomb Ukrainian cities and um, civilian targets. Um, it, so it would be important in order to protect the civilian population and to reduce the damage that Russian troops can cause. However, um, there are a lot of consequences to that. There's, it's uh, what NATO is saying is it's not possible to create a no-fly zone without NATO intervention that would bring them directly into conflict with, you, with Russian airplanes, which would you know, be an act of war. So trying to maintain a certain level of not being actually engaged in active fighting with Russia 
is the primary reason that is being given for not creating a no-fly zone. Uh, so we, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, heard a lot of different uh, reasons for Putin's motivation on this, of either it being he just doesn't want Ukraine to join NATO, um, the, his ideals of bringing back the USSR going down in history. Um, from your experience, what would you say his actual motivation is? I mean, is all of the above an option? I mean, I, I think, yes. <laughs> I, I, um, I think that um, anyone who can, who could like see fully see inside Putin's head would have been able to help resolve this conflict sooner. He's definitely a mystery to many outside analysts. Um, but but my sense is that he very much would like to restore um, a, a shape to Russia, which is more similar to um, to the Soviet Union. And one of the reasons might be because he is uncomfortable with how close um, uh, the, the, the expanding size and the encroachment, in his opinion, of NATO onto territory that that he feels should be under Russian control. So I think it could be both. Um, one wonders whether he is being fully rational in the choices that he's making. And also one wonders whether he's being given, whether he was given accurate information um, regarding the combat readiness of Russian troops before he was told that it would be a, a brief and successful war to invade Ukraine. So I think that perhaps he also did not have accurate information on the about the situation on the ground as well. Thank you. So a lot of the things about this war are unprecedented, particularly in regard to how it's being played out in social media. Mm -hmm. And in particular, one thing that struck me, and, 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 and especially in light of the way um, uh, the Ukrainian president said he doesn't want to ride, he wants ammunition. Um, but is the thing that struck me was that there's actually kind of the equivalent of GoFundMe fundraising for the Ukrainian military. And I'm wondering what you have been hearing about that from your contacts there. So in, um, in 2014, uh, I knew people who every time they went to Ukraine, they packed their suitcase full of um, materials for the Ukrainian military. Obviously they weren't, you know, packing it through, you know, they were, they were packing non-lethal military aid, like, um, you know, medications, uh, um, coagulating agents, like those things that might be needed for people who had been injured in active combat. Um, so it's kind of crowdfunding the Ukrainian army is not a new thing. It is, um, it is neither a rich country nor one that has much, you know, you would think they, they don't, they don't spend a lot of time. They get sent as UN peacekeepers here and there, but they're, they're really not going out there trying to conquer other places. They're primarily a defense force. So they are not sufficiently resourced to maintain um, this long term kind of engagement and furthermore they have they're dealing with thousands and thousands of new volunteers who have not been equipped yet. So they're trying to kind of keep up with with that as well. Um, most of the the uh, fundraisers I have seen are they're also um, they're they're buying military gear, but it's actually for civilians it's things like helmets and flak jackets. And these are for people in uh, cities like Kharkiv that are under active attack, where civilians have no protection against shrapnel or other kinds of um, results of, of these uh, attacks and shootings. Let's just go to somebody new and then we'll come back. Brad? Yeah, um, is this one? Yeah, okay. So, excuse my pronunciation. Is it Volodymyr Velensky? Volodymyr, yeah. Volodymyr. Um, so he's been, you know, supporting the, the fight, right, as a, uh, excuse me, I'm a bit nervous. The, um, uh, excuse me, he's posting these videos, right? But how is his actual ability as like a commander in chief in this time? That's more or less what I'm getting mm -hmm. at. Um, I think, I don't, I mean, I actually, I don't know very much about who is directing the tactics of the Ukrainian army, I assume it's, you know, various generals, um, but I, I think they seem to be doing an excellent job at um, disruption. 
Uh, so, for example, one, there are a number of reasons why that convoy, the military convoy north of Kiev, is stalled. Um, but one of them has, uh, it's been surmised, is that Ukrainian troops are sort of attacking them in a way that prevents them from moving forward. So they're strategically um, choosing to take out vehicles that block the movement forward or taking out fuel vehicles to block the movement forward. So there's a lot of... Um, of good strategy going on there to make use of limited forces and the home ground advantage, so to speak. Um, but I, um, if the if the need of a country in this situation is for a president who can get 91% of the people to think that they can win, um, then he's doing a great job. And I do think that that is an enormous part, part of a war like this, is to keep people engaged, to keep them willing to fight most of the people I know in Ukraine, including ones living in places like Kiev and Kharkiv, um, have chosen to stay. They have not chosen to leave. Uh, and they are ch choosing to stay so that they will be available um, to help defend the city if that becomes necessary. You want to go first? OK, thanks. Um, I suppose I just wanted just to finish off with more of a, uh, or more of a positive note. And basically, the way I see it is that in Europe, we've had a history of wars, and usually after a war, there's always a desire for a better society to come out of it. There's always been a, an urge after a war for it, A, not to happen again, and B, for something better to come out of it. So I'm hopeful that something better will come out of this, both for Ukraine and the rest of Europe, and maybe even for Russia as well. My, um, the way I see it, it can either end in three ways. Something similar to what happened to Khrushchev after the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Brezhnev got in contact with the Politburo and also the military and also the KGB and deposed them because he thought that he was getting a bit crazy, basically, because he almost started World War Three, Or maybe something similar to what happened in the First World War when the Russian army, because of their poor logistics, they got fed up of fighting for czar and then they just they just went back home frankly and we're seeing a lot of that with russian soldiers and even in belarus they're refusing the crimean crimean units refused to go because they were like no nah, we're not going to attack what were our uh at one point our fellow countrymen and basically the the third uh, outcome that i can see probably is the more likely to outcome is something similar to the falklands wars so the military junta that were in charge of Argentina, they were losing popularity. So, they, so the junta thought, let's start a war. Let's go to the Falkland Islands. They were part of Argentina. Let's take them back. And then obviously the British, we came along and we, we uh, pushed them out of, our Argen, uh, sorry, out of the Falkland Islands. And the difference between that conflict and this one is that on the day when Argentina invaded the Falklands, even the opposition in Argentina were for it. and even they were supporting the government saying this is one of the best days in Argentinian history they were claiming stuff like that and we're seeing in Russia Russian people most Russian people they're either afraid or they're protesting or they're I think it's about 50 50 from what I'm hearing from some, most of my Russian friends it just depends on the media that you're looking at but um basically I just yeah I I, I hope something better comes out of this I really do yeah, and I yeah I will say um, I was looking at another poll today that was done uh, you know last week uh, I think last Tuesday or Wednesday, which is Ukrainian attitudes towards um, combatants or towards you know the countries that are involved in this war. And what was extremely interesting to me is that the perception was that about fifty or a seventy percent you know more than fifty percent of Russians supported the war. But um, in terms of Belarus, that very few people actually supported the war and that it was being done sort of outside of their will. And I, I think we do have plenty of evidence that that, that is the case there. Um, what was more interesting to me when you talk about consequences, no matter how this ends, um, they asked people, do you, can you see a way for Russians and Ukrainians? And, and by this, they meant that the people in the two countries as opposed to having anything to do with nationalities inside the country. Can you see them having amicable kinds of relationships in the future? And about 40% said no, which I hope would correct over time. 
but the remainder were divided as to they said yes and and about um, a third of them said yes in um but in 10 to 20 years and another similar portion of the people who said yes said yes but in 20 to 30 years so the level of anger and um Mistrust. Unwillingness to forgive right now is extremely, extremely high. And I, if you have a chance to look at, I don't even know how they can rebuild some of these cities. It's the kind of destruction where there's no asphalt left on the roads of, of major metro, metropolises. It looks a lot like Poland or it looks a lot like Poland or London after the Blitz. So I've seen some of the images; they're pretty shocking. I think something similar to what happened with Belgium, France, and. Germany after both world wars will probably happen. There'll be, you know, mistrust and hatred, but after a few generations, they're sort of. Sorry, in the interest of time, I just want to get to the questions from Zoom. We're, just, we're almost out of time. We just Sorry. got two so, questions and then we'll finish up there. Sorry, yeah. I didn't realize that there were questions on Zoom. Our first question is from Lionel, and it is, to what degree do you believe that the American foreign policy actions, i.e. NATO membership, have increased tensions? Have increased tensions. I will say that I think that the really deliberate um, uh, collaboration with NATO partners have, have created a much stronger um, international wall of opposition and isolated Russia much more effectively than if the United States had acted individually. I think that has been a huge factor in, um, in making it extremely clear, which I will say was not done after the annexation of Crimea, but making it very clear that Russians actions violate international law and that they are not acceptable. Awesome. And our second question is from Spence. And is it true that there is a great deal of corruption in Ukraine in business or government? Oh, yes. Ukraine is is um, is a country with a great deal of, of corruption. Um, but, uh, um, you know, so is Russia. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure. Like, I, yes, it is quite true, um, but but that is true of many countries in the world, and I'm not sure that that actually directly um, affects what is going on. Whereas in Russia, that degree of corruption creates cronyism, where people are very very invested in maintaining allegiance to Putin and keeping them happy. That's not the way it's working in Ukraine. There has been really unified response and support. Um, against this war uh, among uh, corrupt elites in Ukraine. Okay, I think we are technically out of time. Uh, Jennifer, are you okay with staying around if there's any more questions? Uh, yeah, I can take one more. Okay, uh, last one. Yep. <laughs> I have two questions. My first question is, is Mexico part of NATO? Um, I don't know. I don't think so, no. Yeah, I don't think so. Oh, I thought it was American. North, it was like the thing with the... See? Uh, my second question is, by corruption, is it like money embezzlement or like, what kind of corruption? It's a full rainbow of the corruption <laughs> spectrum. <laughs> Um, everything from every day, you have to, you pay the fee to go to the doctor and then you pay the fee on top of the fee to get the doctor to actually treat you. That's like the everyday thing, all the way up to embezzlement, money laundering, offshore accounts and so forth. It runs the full spectrum. And does healthcare in um, Ukraine, is it like provided by the government? Yes, it is. Okay. Let's give Dr. Dickinson a big well, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming everyone.